OK, welcome to our 78th Wedding Online Sport Economics Seminar. Uh, we, uh, we we meet at the same time uh, as the uh, the fifth Gijon uh, conference. I don't actually know the full name of it, but uh, at the moment, uh, a number of um, uh, economists are attending a, a conference in Gijon, uh, which is uh, taking place right now. Uh, and on the subject of the Gijon Sport Economics Conference, you can hopefully find information on here about the uh, conference in a month's time. Uh, you can still submit a paper for that should you uh, should you want to. Uh, the 15th uh, Gijon Conference in Sport Economics is in a month's time. But today we have uh, a Spaniard from a different part of Spain, from the University of Navarra, uh, Pedro Garcia del Barrio, uh, who's presenting, does compliance with financial fair play rules improve the football club's sports performance and their chances to reach UEFA competitions? Uh, please do keep your microphones on mute. Pedro has about an hour in which to talk and there'll be plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And if you have questions for clarification uh, whilst Pedro is talking, please do raise your hand uh, or you can put them in the chat as well, assuming you can see that. Uh, Pedro, uh, go ahead uh, and take away your presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased really to be here with you to share this this time. I would like to thank uh, James and the University of Reading and these Rose seminars. I'm going to share the screen. Let us start. Let me know if you can see my screen. Hopefully, I'm not very keen sometimes, not very skillful with this. Uh, OK. Yep, there we go. We've got your slides now. All right. And you can listen, of course. So is it working well? Yes, You've, we've got the presenter view right now. Pedro, I don't know if you can just um, go into the normal presentation mode. Um, My Spanish isn't good enough to know what the right option uh, is. I think if you if you exit that and then um, is this one? No. If you okay. hit the X, I think top right corner. And perhaps if you try and um, just share the actual window itself, the PowerPoint. Mm. I'm not sure how to do that. That is. Um... It might be the duplicate one. Though. Was that was that one of the options there? Duplicate this, you mean? See if it works. Oh, oh. OK. Yep, perfect. Thanks. Yep. That's great. Thank you. So uh, thanks for, for coming. I, I'm pleased, as I mentioned before, to be here to share some piece of research with you. Uh, this is a joint work in progress a paper with Pablo Agnese from Universitat Internacional de Catalunya and, and I, Pedro Garcia del Barrio, from the University of Navarra. Navarra in the north of Spain. So I, I've been working uh, to similar topics in the past, but this is a more simple, I would say, a more specific empirical approach to the impact that the financial fair play in, imposed by UEFA might have on sport performance. There are, oh, this is not working, let's see. Now, so the scope of the paper is uh, based on, on this study, whether these imposition or these regulations implemented by UEFA, apart from helping the football clubs to uh, deliver more sustained financial stability, whether they these norms might help those clubs to uh, manage in a more efficient way the, the, also the, the sporting outcomes. So, in principle, to our best of our knowledge, there, there is no empirical evidence or empirical studies to examine this link between compliance with the rules um, issued by UEFA and the club's sport performance. We are going to make use of a somehow balance or, or uh, bias, sorry, a data sample because we only look at first division teams. We have selected 
four of the top domestic leagues, basically due to uh, availability of data, we didn't, weren't unable to get data from the German Bundesliga. So, uh, therefore, we concentrate on the 20 teams playing in the first division league of the English Premier League, the Spanish La Liga, uh, Italian Serie A and French League One. And this over a period of seven years that uh, is from uh, season 2009-10 until 2015-16. So the individual data, of course, on this. There is only three observations missing in the, that period um, because those, generally that's because a, a club goes bankruptcy or something and they don't report the official uh, figures. So what is the context? As I mentioned before, that paper came out uh, as a, a result of something else that we were looking at with uh, Gian Battista Rossi, that was the influence or the effect of these financial fair play rules on a competitive balance. But that, that paper moves somewhere else, so it points towards a different direction. But the context still is this of how institutional and legal reforms might affect the priorities of clubs and might actually affect, in that particular case, the sport, their sport achievements. So examples of institutional reforms, there are many in, in European football. Uh, you might think of the Bosman law, of course, you can think of the change in competitive structure of the UEFA Champions League back in 1992, and many changes affecting the rights of television and, and broadcasting rights in, of this uh, sport discipline. So our purpose here is to empirically study uh, if the degree of fulfillment to these break-even requirements that I will explain in a few minutes of the UEFA financial fair play rules make an impact, a systematic empirical significant influence on sport performance and sport achievements. In addition, of course, to help uh, to improve the financial stability of, club, of clubs. So the, the, let me give you a little bit of, of uh, flavor of how the industry has been evolving in the last years. There is this unfortunate uh, event of the COVID crisis, which has slowed down the, or even stopped in the last year the, ten, the trend or the, the pattern in, in the, this is annual uh, revenues of the different leagues and the total aggreg aggregate figure for the big five leagues, including the German Bundesliga. The, we, we've got data, aggregate data for, for the German football. We lack individual at the uh, club level uh, observed data, and therefore the empirical analysis will only focus on the other four main uh, top domestic leagues. But basically that, that is the, the context, you see. Even in the middle of this financial crisis starting in 2007 or, nine, or, or eight, that the trend in, in that particular sector has been amazing. That these are the revenues of the English Premier League, which rocketed up at uh, the end of, of the 2030 uh, season. Uh, but the other leagues as well behave very well in terms of capacity to generate revenues. If we then look at the annual wages, which is going to be a much more protagonist variable in our empirical study, we again observe this positive trend uh, following in line the evolution of the revenues, of course. There are, interestingly enough, there is, if you compare, for instance, the revenues of the Spain, Spanish and German leagues, they, they've been very close to each other in the last decades. Whereas in terms of revenues, or, or sorry, wages, it seems that the Spanish La Liga has been overspending in, in wages as compared to, to the German Bundesliga. And this is very much one of the, 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 the main explanatory variables of the, the model I'm going to explain. So that would give you the figures for the wage to revenue ratio uh, for each of these um, domestic leagues at, uh, over the, the, the seasons starting in the, in the 21st century. So there is initially we thought that the implementation around 2011 or 12 and then the actual 
uh, enforcement of penalties in, in the season 13 and 14, this had provoked like a convergence of the of the leagues towards a similar ratio in terms of what is the share of operating revenues that teams use to pay wages. So that you, you can observe this trend like coming closer together. However, it, it doesn't to be anymore the case. There are especially outliers in the uh, French League One. And uh, I, I, we didn't make the, the, the detailed analysis because that was not part of the scope of this paper to look to what, what are the, the clubs perhaps behind this uh, behavior so uh, different to the others. Also the COVID, of course, the COVID uh, crisis has um, uh, certainly affected this distorted, uh, um, this, this uh, changing patterns really in the share of revenues that teams used to pay wages. Okay, now what is the, the context also in, in, in terms of the industry? Professional football is part of a much broader industry, the entertainment industry, and professional football players are the main inputs, the main most um, relevant actors to create value, uh, entertainment and spectacle, and they display their skills on the field but the, precisely within that context that we want to analyze other skills, managerial skills to be more specific, how do they might make an impact in the sporting outcome and therefore in the capacity of the industry to generate spectacle. So uh, we, uh, besides the, the, the sporting talent associated to the team roster of the clubs, we consider another valuable asset such as teamwork, uh, you know, good environment, managerial skills, and we explore to what extent those assets might be relevant inputs that contribute to the production function, if you wish. So the, we, the analysis is going to mix together uh, financial or managerial skills along with the sporting skills. Let me tell you, because this is, you know, a seminar. I'm, by the way, I, I will appreciate any comments, of course, uh, constructive criticisms very much, because we, we sent already once this paper recently, and um, it was rejected. So we are now in the second attempt to prepare. We have modified quite a, a number of things because we were rejected. But, you know, that one of these things that we receive a very, very rich report uh, we are very grateful to the referees because they made a very good job and we hopefully, you know, it, it has helped to improve what you are going to listen at as well. So what is new, for instance, one of the criticisms we received was that the paper was simply an empirical exercise. And then we have a step back to elaborate a theoretical framework on which this empirical study has been made. And, and I will place this, of course, at front. Uh, but you, you are economists like me, so you perfectly know that many, of, very often, we proceed that way. That uh, you know, it's not that uh, you've got very clear-minded at the beginning of, of what is the underlying theoretical connections, and then by learning from empirics, from the empirical results, then you can uh, develop a proper theory and, and improve your understanding of the facts. Okay, so what are the, then the actual motivation and the objectives that we pursue with this paper? First, to explore that interaction that I mentioned between sporting skills and managerial skills. Um, this will be the two. I remember attending uh, last seminar last week, um, and then I will make a mention to it at the end if, if there is time because. Uh, the, this girl uh, who presented it, I cannot remember the name by heart, uh, she uh, proposed that production function in which managerial skills were also also involved. So I made my, I, I took my screen uh, pictures to, to, to learn from that and, and, and it was helpful for, for us to, to keep thinking around the theoretical underlying elements here. Okay, so that's first the first uh, purpose or objective to explore a little bit what are these interactions, how do they work. Secondly, we evaluate to what extent the football clubs clubs uh, fulfill with these 
regulations imposed by UEFA and how this compliance with the UEFA rules might affect their sport achievements. And thirdly, we examine to what extent precisely the opposite so, so, somehow. So to what extent lack of financial good management, so an increasing uh, mismanagement might uh, have a negative impact on the sport achievement of the clubs. The results, I tell you in, 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 at front, uh, we find a very strong empirical evidence that greater financial responsibility goes along with better sport performances. And it applies, uh, it, these results are very robust to different model specifications. And they also, of course, they will affect the chances that clubs face and, and, and has have to, to reach qualify the, the final European uh, UEFA competitions. Okay, so uh, that are the, the objectives. Now, moving on, what are the, these theoretical hypotheses that we propose? We uh, propose or to combine sporting skills along with managerial abilities to interact together to produce the sport success. So our hypothesis is that the clubs sport performance will depend not only on the quality of the team roster, the, the components of the, of the club, the players, but also it will depend upon the quality of the coaching staff and other managerial abilities beyond the, the, the playing field. So um, in, that, in, in this regard, we will focus on financial abilities as to capture somehow more general abilities of the, of the club. To test this idea, we will carry out a basic, a, a very basic empirical analysis where the production function combines both types of skills. The skills, of course, will be measured through proxy variables. It's not easy to, to do other ways. The quality of the team roster will be captured through the annual wages. It has revealed to be a very, very effective proxy variable to measure, uh, to approximate the quality of the team. And then coaching and managerial abilities will be approximated through the wage to revenue ratio in the form uh, we are going to illustrate and to explain uh, soon, very soon. What are the procedure and the empirical strategies? As I mentioned before, uh, well, I, I think I didn't specify those details, but uh, in the empirical analysis, we have split it up in two parts. In the first case, the dependent variable is going to be the number of points achieved, accumulated at the end of the season in the domestic league. So uh, as then the explanatory variables, the main, the most uh, relevant one for our purpose will be the fulfillment of break-even require, requirements as measure or capture through wage to revenue ratio, ratios. So uh, that we are in search of this empirical link between managerial good practices and then uh, sporting success. So that is what we want to investigate. Now, the second strategy, rather than using as dependent variable the number of points in the domestic league, we will uh, build, develop this logic specification model to uh, try to determine the probability or the chances that clubs have to reach the European UEFA competitions, meaning they need to keep, to remain, depending on what domestic league, they need to be among the three, four uh, top leagues in the, uh, in the upper part of the classification at the end of the season. So obviously, uh, the, the second approach is very much similar to the first one, only that you will see that it allows us to introduce very interesting analysis uh, in the form of marginal effects, etc. OK, so in, for the latter ap approach is when we will apply this logic model specification, whereas the, the former approach will de be developed on linear uh, OLA expansions. Uh, related literature, well, there are some seminal papers that are behind all this type of work because we deal with these production functions. Then there is the paper by Semansky, by Semansky and Smith. There is also the work by Forrest and Simmons. 
And then more recently, productivity equations like the, the analysis made by Carmichael et al. In, in the Bulletin of Economic Research, that has been an inspiration as well for this research. More specifically, as I mentioned before, the, the, the scope of the paper and the context is that of the relationship between sport and managerial outcomes. So there are a number of references that you might want to consider there. Maiden, Gio, Gallagher, etc. And more, more importantly, perhaps, papers making use of this wage to revenue ratio. A recent paper published by Di Simone and Zanardi, they use exactly the same variable that they call differently. They call it staff to sales ratio. But this, um, if you uh, uh, read through carefully, that's exactly the same uh, financial rate or ratio than the one we use. Okay, now moving on the specific uh, empirical study. Well, apart from other effects of regulatory limits, like imposing salary caps, and some, some, uh, some scholars have addressed that point, uh, there is this debate on whether the financial fair play rules make a positive or negative impact on the competitive balance in the European football leagues. So there, there are contrasting arguments and findings, or, or and, and I mentioned that the, the paper by Peters and Semansky, that's a very influential paper, I suppose. Uh, I learned a lot by, by reading through that through it. And then there is one the previous paper I mentioned with uh, my colleague Rossi that uh, addresses also that, that issue. Now, data, yeah, I mentioned already the database consists of this. 560 observations, so 20 teams per league and season. In the end, the pool sample were comp comprises only 557. There were three missing values um, due to data and I, uh, yeah, this uh, and I uh, non, non reported uh, data by three clubs. Then data sources comes from uh, the clubs accounts and also in some cases from these reports by Deloitte, so very well well now. There might be in that regard, notice that there might be some uh, discrepancies in the data sources because uh, the accounting Spanish system has the official re re uh, registration that's called the uh, Registro Mercantil, might be you know, imposing a slightly different accounting type of norms perhaps. It's not, it's not the same source where we, we collect all the four season this for um, domestic leagues information and that is why at some stage we split up in for the, the empirical analysis you get here some just coming to um, observe or to describe some descriptive statistics that that gives you the mean and the standard deviation of the main variables the dependent variables i mentioned before will be number of points accumulated at the end of the season in each of the domestic leagues. So obviously, there is uh, we neglect the sport performance beyond the, the domestic the, the points in the domestic leagues here. Uh, we only may control uh, control the, the possibility for teams to, to reach to be competing in the in the European competitions. Although we, we didn't apply that controls here in what I'm going to show you here because they, they seem not to be so relevant. And then if you split up the sample in the different seasons, the period of seven seasons we analyze, there is a quite close to balance uh, figures, almost except the two first seasons and then that season 14 and 15, there is uh, the full sample to be observed. And then in the mean, the evolution of the mean, that's the weights to revenue ratio, sorry, I didn't mention it. So the split up in, in this, over the seasons, is to analyze more in detail the explanatory variable that we call wage to revenue ratio. And there is this convert this decreasing trend, although it has changed pattern in recent years as we have so fast. But these those years do not affect the, sam the sample period that we analyze here. Uh, differences also across leagues in terms of this wage to revenue ratio. So it seems that there is inflation in wages affecting the French football. 
And to the other extreme, we found the Italian Serie A, perhaps because during that period, they enjoyed this, those huge uh, TV and broadcast rights. Uh, although they pay well their players, but you know they deviate from, from the average, which would be more kind of represented by the Spanish and the uh, English football. Okay, this, let us move on uh, the methodology. Uh, this is a work in progress, as I mentioned before. So we are, uh, Pablo and me will be very grateful if you criticize or propose some constructive recommendations to improve the, the, the storytelling, really. So we consider uh, the usual Cobb Douglas production function. That is the underlying theoretical framework that we propose for uh, the final empirical analysis, where the outcome, P, uh, denotes the number of points at the end of season. So this is the variable to capture sport achievements, and it results from combination of both sporting and managerial inputs. So they are combined not in an additive manner because they reinforce each other by through the conventional Cobb Douglas production function. There is this multiplying uh, relationship. We further assume that both alpha and beta are going to take value one. So and that is a quite a strong uh, assumption to be made, which matters rather than whether it is one or, or just simply greater than 0.5, basically. It means that we are assuming here increasing returns to scale. Why do we impose that, those increasing returns to scale? Well, there are constant returns to scale attached to one, to one single input change in value because it, alpha takes value one or beta takes value one. But when we change simultaneously the amount or the proportion of inputs all together, one plus one is two. So it means there is a twice the, the, the effect on the output. Those increasing returns to scale, why did we impose this relationship? Well, basically because we expect the output to increase more than proportionally to increases in the use of inputs. And the reason being because since many years now, the reward given to one victory is two points more than as compared to draw to an even result. Whereas losing the game means only one point penalty as compared to draw. So if there is the, this two to one relationship and we believe that maybe that might uh, give support to this increasing returns to scale. So just to illustrate with a funny uh, characters here, you might recognize these people, uh, perhaps the two strongest players and rivalries in the recent times, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi. So this is, you know, this paper is about pla playing player skills uh, as essential part of the production function. But we also want to consider the coaching and managerial skills, uh, not only in the in terms of coaching staff of the team and playing team, but also involving financial um, uh, management and, and efficiency in the organizational management overall. So the empirical analysis, just moving on a little bit closer to the results, the empirical analysis aims to uh, explain the points achieved in domestic leagues based on three main variables. The first one is the quality of the team squad or roster of the team. And this is going to be captured by annual revenues. Secondly, we use wage to revenue ratio as a proxy of mismanagement in the form that I will explain in a few moments. And therefore, well, eventually we will also incorporate the inverse of revenues. By the way, that was uh, one of the strongest crit uh, criticisms that we received in the when we sent this paper for the, the first and last time to, to be to, to a journal. And as one of the recommendations of one of the referee reports were, was to incorporate revenues as a proxy of the size market of the teams. So we had or we thought we, it was not necessary because we had already used annual wages, which are closely related. There is a very high correlation between wages and revenues for, for at the team level, 
and and I will show you how we, the, we do deal with this issue in the end. So if we accept that the production function is the one we mentioned before, so it is that A accounts for uh, technology that is a constant, whereas S, these are the sporting, sporting skills, skills, that's, that's one, input. one input, and second, M, are the managerial skills, the, the other important input, at time uh, associated to team I at time T. So this is the, the... Now, we introduce here a further refinement on the analysis because we model the two sources of per, per, performance, namely sport performance and managerial performance. We express this, them as linear functions of their respective compensations. What do we mean by compensations? Uh, sport skills are compensated, uh, are rewarded by paying salaries. So we impose this uh, linear functional form relation rela relating the sport skills, which is the input, but the, it, uh, with the reward to those skills, which are given in the form of annual revenues to the, the, the annual revenue of the team, remember it was the proxy of the quality of the team squad. And then why do we argue here that, that, that notice that's not the wage to revenue ratio, it is rather the opposite, to, to indicate that this is kind of, of profits. That ratio gives you mm, by how much the, the team is able to generate revenues in excess to the cost of running the club. So revenues over wages, this uh, is the, the reward given to a, a well-managed man, uh, well uh, organization. If, uh, in many cases, even there are those bonus given to the managers if they outperform in financial terms. So basically, that is the, the additional element we propose here. Then, furthermore, because we want to focus attention on the financial fair play rules, then rather than this R over W, we redefine M, in we change just the value of the estimated parameters, and we uh, express to the inverse function of the re revenue to, re to wage, which is the wage to revenue ratio, of course. And then we only do what we do is to uh, change the expected value of the sign of these parameters. So we expect this minus D to be negative, obviously. Plugging both scales now, that expression here, A plus B, W, and then that expression here into the production function, and then elaborating on that, that is what we got. So this is a constant, that is another fixed um, parameter, which is going to be estimated, by the way, multiplying the salary, then minus this new parameter multiplying the wage to revenue ratio. And finally, the same, as you notice, that is exactly identical to that, multiplying the, sorry, sorry, that's a mistake. This no, no still, this is gonna uh, come in a minute. So this is different because this is A and this is B. So it, it is attached now to the square of this because um, we multiply, remember that what we do is to combine in a multiplicative way these two uh, sources of skills. So W times this ratio here gives us a result that. Now, if we simplify the, the different elements, that's what we get by renaming the parameters, collecting them in, into, into a, a single estimated coefficient that we are going to estimate, we get this conventional specification form, which is full of meaning, really, because it tells us that the wages by construction, uh, accepting this underlying theoretical relationship of this increasing returns to scale cop douglas function, it happens that there is a quadratic form, as it is conventional, affecting wages. So the productivity increases, but it diminishes. The, the, the speed, the rate at which uh, the quality of the squad transform quality into outcome, into points, obviously because there is this roof level of the number of points in the end. 
And then there is this uh, very important element of wage to revenue ratio. And finally, we obtain here the inverse of the revenue, uh, the, the amount of revenues per year. And that needs to be constrained to, to, to deliver the same coefficient as the quadratic form of the salary. And that is imposed by these uh, assumptions that we made. So this, this is in the estima estimations. What we did was to impose that constraint. We, we apply constraint OLS estimation. So uh, yeah, this is basically what I just explained. So the model specification delivers the usual, the typical quadratic form for affecting salaries. But besides, we manage in that way, in an indirect way, uh, one over revenues permits us to introduce this uh, size, market size of the team, if you wish. So that, that is then the type of equations that we are going to show you now the results. Uh, we control for season and also individual effects by league and also uh, fixed effects by at the team level. So this we run also in addition to pool OLS, we also run fixed effects model estimation. What are the main hypothesis or, or uh, aspects that we want to test? First, we, want, we, we are very much interested into the, the, the sign and significance level of this wage to revenue ratio. Basically, yeah, that's, uh, that's here. If this is negative, it means that the growing shares in spending in salaries, so a higher wage to revenue ratio, which, go, which is interpreted as higher financial mismanagement, so if you, you know, if you spend all your revenues in the form of wages, it means you didn't take care about the financial stability of your club. So the higher this ratio, the higher level of mismanagement, and that entails fewer or poor uh, sport performances. So that, that is what, what we expect. This negative, uh, this delta three is positive, but it is accompanied by the negative sign. So we expect this to be negative. Um, the opposite case would apply if the, it is uh, the, the, that that coefficient would be positive. Okay, so let's let's move on. I think I'm uh, because perhaps of my English skills as well. Sorry for that. I, I want just to get involved in the results for you to have time to 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 raise questions or to discuss the results. So first, notice that um, there is this. A collection of estimations where we separate the analysis in two levels. First, we introduce, well, but we don't report, by the way, the coefficient and significant levels of that uh, inverse of revenues because these coefficients happens or needs to be exactly identical to that. So by looking at the coefficient attached to wage to revenue, you, you get to know what are the, the revenue of the inverse of the revenues, the coefficient, sorry of the inverse of revenues. And they all were significant as these are significant. So basically it means that negative sign as was expected, which means more mismanagement translating to better sport performance or in positive, a better financial and organizational good management involves a better sport outcomes. That's what we get. And that is the quadratic form of the salary, which is, of course, overall positive because this coefficient is very, very tiny, as you notice here. So we, we find these strong results both for OLS and also for the fixed effect estimation models. Then we explore a different approach by splitting up in different uh, intervals that explanatory variable, which is the main focus of our interest. So uh, we collect here all the observations that were be, be below 50% of the salary uh, spent, 50% of the revenue being spent in the form of salaries. That is between 50 and 60, 60 and 70, and so on and so forth, and eventually greater than 90%. So as you observe here, there is this um, negative impact. The size of the coefficient grows bigger as we progress that way and only few of them happens to be significant. So perhaps that is the, the, the most relevant 
uh, effect is this this feature of the strong negative and significant uh, effect here and also in the in the upper part of the of the non compliance of financial fair play rules which happens here over that that corner here so there is increasing amounts of penalty in terms of sport performance as we progress that way uh, if we look then at the same estimations but in deviations from the mean so the previous war is the outcome for modules in levels but in the literature stressed the necessity to analyze very often these production functions with respect to your rival teams and those competitors are better um, analyze that that outcomes if we just introduce the deviations from the mean per league and period right if we do that exercise we get a very similar results only that the, the again the, the r square and the i this uh, to to discriminate between models uh, lead us to believe that the fixed effect models are better um, although yeah this, this is more tricky i suppose to compute that way and then again very strong results in the in the same direction i mentioned better results here concerning these uh, refined analysis of well increasing generally from 6.2 well, down to minus three and then up to plus, minus seven, minus 12. So as we deviate more strongly from the compliance with the UEFA uh, rules, clubs find a stronger penalty in terms of sport performance. Remember that we are all the time controlling by the quality of the team squad. So that surprising, initially surprising result has now been split up in the four different leagues and it happens to be uh, driven by the English Premier League, the Italian Serie A mainly, and also in the French football. It doesn't happen to be significant in the Spanish football. So, it, it, you know, there is further or future research effort to try to explain what is going on in the case of football or Spanish football with this, this aspect. And finally, if we look at the logic modules to focus attention not just on the number of points that those clubs achieve, but how likely they are to reach European competitions, either the Europa League or the Champions League. Um, we, I, I have, in that table, we have presented all together deviations from salary modules, those here, with just uh, estimations in levels. And again, we either use the, that uh, weights to revenue variable altogether, or we model that variable by being split up in different intervals. If you notice here, the, the, the results are very, very robust um, to explain the probability to reach the tank. So we are focusing attention at the upper part of the distribution of the quality of the teams, if you notice. And this makes that these effects, th those effects became more, much more relevant, at, uh, uh, affecting the, the, top class, the top class clubs or teams. Um, okay, what about the probability? Well, that, that's exactly what, I, what I've been explaining with a little bit more of detail in, 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 in that. The, the, that gives us the detail of the split up analysis, whereas this was the result of the basic baseline models, both in levels and then in deviation. No, that is in, in levels exactly, and these are the same estimation model in deviations from the mean level. The, the, the mean of uh, calculated at every season and and, and period, season, and, and domestically, sorry. Uh, okay, if rather than Europa League, we focus attention on the Champions League, very similar results emerge. So there is this strong empirical uh, result that the more mismanagement in financial terms, the less likely the team will reach European competitions. Now, this, as I uh, announced before, permits us a more qualitative analysis by focusing attention on the marginal effects. 
So if we look at the derivatives, uh, that is the what we obtain here. And then in the second, in these columns, in, in those columns in between, we have calculated the percentual change in terms of the magnitude of the estimated coefficient here. So it seems to be a threshold applying beyond at the level of 70% of the revenues being expended in salaries, where those the size, the, the, the magnitude percentual change becomes much, much greater at that level. You know, that is like this threshold level. And it grows bigger even in negative values, of course, all the way through uh, as we increase or as teams deviate from the financial compliance. Uh, or, or fulfillment of the uh, UEFA rules. That applies a little bit less strongly to Champions League in the, well, not, not really, but you know, there's a, this increasing trend of negative values uh, are slightly smaller in the case of the Champions League. And finally, if you analyze with the help of this graphical analysis, uh, the evolution of that ratio, wage to revenue ratio, how, how do the effect of the salaries variate along with this ratio? That's very, very interesting to notice. So the probability to reach the final, the, the, the European competitions increases along with the salary, but it does have a less positive impact as we, or teams, uh, deviate or fail to fulfill the compliance with the UEFA rules. So the, the, it is always positive, as you see here, um, as we progress to greater. Uh, so that is the effect, sorry, of one increase, marginal effect of one increase in, of 1%, let's say, in salary. But it affects differently as we move along those, ratio, those uh, wage to revenue ratio values. And it happens that when we reach uh, teams that deviate very much, the marginal effect, positive marginal effect of increasing salaries makes a much smaller impact than other ways. And the same applies to reach uh, Champions League rather than the UEFA Cup. So to end up, conclusions, uh, we have analyzed a data set for the main first division of the main leagues in Europe. Uh, and we conclude that the compliance with the UEFA break-even requirements seems to imply or to go along with better sport achievements as well. Not only provoke greater financial stability, but they also encourage uh, somehow better sport or uh, permits better sport achievements. And that conclusion seems to be very robust to uh, cross leagues and also different estimation models and empirical strategies. So, okay, um, sorry for that too long speech, perhaps. Thank you for your attention. And I will welcome any, any comments you might have. No Thank need you. to apologize, Pedro. It was perfectly timed and it was very interesting as well. So thank you very much for your talk. We have a couple of uh, points in the chat. Well, actually, one of them is by uh, Mobilaji, but he's got his hand up. But before he uh, comes in, uh, Anthony uh, Marcello has asked, did you test if the uh, lower to wage to revenue ratio also improved the chances of avoiding relegation? No, but th that's absolutely right. That's the next step, certainly. And not only that, but uh, yeah, but basically that's the main one. Yes. So uh, I remember James and me discussing for a different paper. Let me stop. Should I keep the screen just in case or? Yeah, I think if you turn it off because yeah. It's okay, not, thanks. It's uh, no. Just hold uh, on a second. Yeah. Okay, now. Yes, uh, absolutely. So we were discussing the same issue for a different paper and that's uh, for sure a very relevant aspect. Did I succeed to stop? Yep, yep. All, okay. It's all good now. Uh, yep, great. So that uh, answers Anthony's question. And then so Mabalaji with your hand up, go ahead. Hello, um, thank you. It's, um, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah, so I just had a few questions. Um, the wage to revenue <laughs> proxy, right? And that's what proxies um, uh, financial fair play. Um, I'm, I just want to confirm that's what you use to proxy financial fair play, right? Wage to revenue um, ratio. 
Yes, it is actually the opposite. Revenue to wage okay, revenue. is equivalent to profits, and that would be a proxy for uh, financial stability. Because we introduced the other way around, wage to, to revenue ratio, we expect the negative sign. Okay, okay. Um, the, the reason why I ask is that um, one of the things that, or what it, what it leaves out is um, transfers, transfer fees, amortization, which is, um, I think, a huge part of what financial fair play is looking at. Because if I'm not mistaken, the wages there only stands for um, employee benefits, right? If that's the case, it takes out, it leaves out um, the transfer um, fees that are paid for players. So I think that's something that can also be added to see, because, I mean, I'll give an example. You look at Barcelona, for example, and Manchester City. Barcelona might have a higher wage bill, right? But Man City is spending much more on um, buying players. So I think if you add both of them together, it might give a, a, a good picture of um, the financial fair play regulation. Then also, in terms of um, sporting success, right? So, I mean, I think um, the wages is what determines that there's usually a lag between sporting skills and when they are compensated by um, better wages. So, for example, um, let me look for an example of a player. I think um, in uh, Lionel Messi's first year um, in Barcelona, or even in his second year, he had played so well, but of course hadn't signed a new contract. So there's usually a lag of probably a year or two before they are rewarded with new contracts. I don't know if that's something that can also be taken into um, consideration. Then um, the teams that do not qualify for UEFA competitions naturally would have um, worse levels of wage um, to revenue ratio or revenue to um, wage um, um, ratio because they're not going to be getting the additional um, income from UEFA competitions. And in that case, what then happens is that they don't have enough money to buy players and to also remunerate their players in the best way. That would also limit their um, domestic um, 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 competition and performance. So I don't know if that's something that you also um um looked at or controlled for then the last point is i think the last slide where you looked at the ucl and the uel and the uefa um europa league um usually the the amount that the, the amount of money that we um, received in the ucl is greater than the uel so definitely i think that the conclusion you made that the changes in the U, ucl is less than the changes in the uel I, I i think it makes a lot of sense because um their revenue is very very different thank you but all in all, it was a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, what's your name? I, I was unable to see what, who was speaking. What's your name? Sorry. Okay, it's um, Mobolaji Alabi. Mobolaji Alabi. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mobolaji. Okay. Mobolaji. Thank you very much. I, I have written down the three comments. Well, the last one, rather than a question, is a suggestion or, or a clarification of your interpretation of the facts. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And the two other comments, uh, I mean, you are absolutely right. The transfer fees plays a very important role in all that. Uh, I recently read a paper that uh, I had to make the referee as well, actually of a paper that uh, comprised altogether the analysis of wages along with transfer fees, but it's very difficult to get all that data. The, uh, some literature argued that they, there is a strong correlation between the two, the wage, annual wage of the of the club and the value of the assets of the, you know, the, but rather than the value of the asset, the transfer fee or the transfer, the market value of the players. But this is not the case season by season. So you are completely right that this will for sure distort the accuracy of our proxy variable to account for this. Um, yeah, I don't. Okay, I'm not very optimistic that we can achieve, get those da this data overall. And the second one, uh, perhaps that is more complicated in a sense, but more affordable. Endogeneity in the end, so you you know the revenues will be affected by the fact of qualifying or not to the European competitions. What we've done for this, I mentioned that we are now producing a new paper after having received uh, this referee report. And one of the um, experiments we ran were the same regression analysis with the one lack of the dependent variable. And nothing essentially changed, 
So, you know, which surprises us, apart from all the comments you might have on the theoretical, the underlying theoretical framework, which is dubious, you know, you can, uh, or those comments that you made, the fact remains that this is, this is very uh, a strong, consistent, negative empirical result. Uh, whether the bias that might introduce reverse causalities is enough to yeah, this, discard these results is something that perhaps James or somebody else, some econometrician might, might tell. But thank you very much. Very, very appropriate comments. Thanks. OK, um, sorry, James. I, I can give you the data for transfers for English clubs. Um, I have that and I think I also have for some Spanish and Italian clubs. I can give you that data. OK, I will appreciate this a, a lot. I mean, I, I can share with you the, the data on wages and then, you know, this. Uh, sure, send me please an email and we keep chatting on that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mabalaji. Thanks, Pedro. Any more questions and comments? James, I don't know how do you feel about reverse causality issues here, or maybe you can let me know. Not to the, this week has been a long week, so next next week, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely uh, I'm going to appreciate a little bit more time to digest. Uh, I know, think it's Stefan. Uh, yeah, have, Stefan's got his hand up. So I'm I'll pleased. Let's... I'm very pleased to listen to Stefan. <laughs> hey, Pedro, long time no see. How good to see you. <laughs> That's um, right. I saw you last week because you intervened in the previous. Oh. <laughs> but you, you didn't see me because I was with the screen off. <laughs> yeah, no, you have to turn your screen on and start shouting like me. That's, that's <laughs> definitely something you should do. Um, <laughs> so I, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I think, uh, you, know, you know, I'm a very I'm skeptical about financial fair play anyway, so um, <laughs> I, I don't believe any of this, but, but that's just my <laughs> prejudice rather than the empirical evidence that you presented. Um, but I, I mean, uh, one thing I'd be interested to see, because it's, I mean, it's actually a relatively small number of clubs. And of course, UEFA, when they talk about financial fair play, their their annual review covers something like 700 clubs across many different leagues, right? And I think in, in some ways, um, I don't think financial fair play was ever really aimed, for example, at the Premier League. I don't think that was its that was really its target. Um, although it, its name came up it was really about the 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 financial problems in in many of the other many of the smaller leagues in europe but one thing i had struck me was that when you when the 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 revenue um to wage ratio is going to uh collapse when clubs are are doing badly when things are going wrong for them i mean that's and one thing that it that's very clear when clubs become insolvent. Um, you see that ratio rise very dramatically in the years leading up. So sort of even for four or five years out before a club becomes insolvent, you will see the the revenue to wage ratio collapsing. Um, so what I would, you know, the, what I think one of the issues I have here is sort of, you know, which way causality is running. What's What's happening here is that these clubs are um, these clubs are struggling. They're 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 not doing well in the league, and um, that's what may well be driving this this result. So I don't know if you've looked at that. So I I would just say um, just look at the clubs that are in your that are in this basket of of of, of poorly performing financial clubs, and then say, well, you know, what, what was actually happening to them? And how, for example, how did their league position compare to the previous year? Have they, have they suddenly doing a lot worse than they had been doing? It strikes me that, so, you know, my view of this is that most of this financial adversity in, in football is actually about negative shocks. It's these are random events that, because of promotion and relegation, they really impact very severely the performance of the clubs and so i just wonder if you could look at some of these maybe look at these tr some of these trajectories of the clubs to see how that's changing thank you very much stefan uh, when you mention clubs collapse you mean that the re wage to revenue ratio go beyond 100 percent or 90 percent or 
Yeah, and, and you are absolutely right that uh, we didn't look in detail, and we should actually, so we will certainly do, to look at the existence of outliers that might be driven that trend. More, but more importantly, what you mentioned in the previous seasons, I know that you published this paper on, on clubs failing and financial bankruptcies. I, I, would, I, I cannot remember now whether, how did you deal with this dynamic issues because they are always very problematic in empirical terms and, and, and before you you perhaps give me a, an insight on that the remember that the second half of the analysis was focused in the upper part of the well absolutely right uh, we will introduce them in the storytelling that the financial fair play rules are more focused on on those other leagues uh, not the top tier clubs but uh, what is interesting to notice as well is that it seems to apply to the upper part of the quality distribution of teams because that's what we look at in the logic model estimation with the chances for reaching the, the European leagues. Uh, but yes, certainly we need to, to look for those outliers, perhaps especially tracking back what happened in the previous season with the, the wage to revenue ratio. Well, it, another, I mean, the other one other thing to say, I mean, Spain, for example, in this period is a very, very special case, right? Because Spain uh, obviously was bankrupted during the, the previous financial crisis, right? <laughs> was undergoing a massive restructuring throughout the early um, 2010s. And now we know that um, Barcelona and Real Madrid are both bankrupt again, aren't they? So to say that Spain is somehow not not playing a role in this, I mean, something's funny going. Something's going on in Spain, right? I mean, there's no question about that, right? I think so. I don't know. Do you think Real Madrid is as much in bankruptcy as Barcelona? That's the only thing you care about, Pedro. I know. No, I, 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 I just no, Barcelona is definitely worse. You can you can rest assured of that. But still, in absolute terms, I still think Real Madrid's probably bankrupt as well, right? You see, the, the data sample stopped in 2015 and 16. Uh, you might suspect that this is not lack of data availability, but something. No, no, no. I'm just. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's very difficult to keep updated your data. You know perfectly well. So, uh, yeah. But that's, well, that's you, I mean, you're covering precisely this period of financial reconstruction, which uh, didn't the government end up bailing out the clubs to, to a substantial degree? So in, in, in all of that, I mean, it's not even clear that, you know, that you can treat Spain as comparable to these to these other cases. All right. I, uh, it's just one thought anyway. OK, thanks. Because, the, in fact, the, the table where we uh, discriminate, we separate the analysis of Spain deviate from the others. That's right. So uh, it happened not to be significant. It was negative coefficient, but it was not significant. Uh, yeah, I, I think something I, I learned from Stefan, but I, I should have forgotten, I suppose, was when, when you got the overall picture, uh, never ever stop paying attention to the individual. But that, you know, that's very difficult to do, to, to get back to the individual data and trying to, to search, to investigate what is behind. Uh, you remember, Stefan, that we made a lot of work on that back there in, in Imperial. No, to try to understand why the decision of the different clubs and this, yeah, what, what is behind this uh, trend, empirical general trends. Uh, but uh, certainly we need to look at those uh, pot potential outliers. So, Thank you, James. Maybe too long speech. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's fantastic, Pedro. Thanks, Stefan, as well. Uh, Thank you, Stefan. A pleasure. Any more questions and comments? Um, Pedro, um, if I can get your email so I can send you an email. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I can put you two uh, in contact with each other, uh, so don't don't worry too much about uh, sharing details. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. Well, it looks like there's no more 
uh, comments for you, Pedro. So thank you very much uh, for what was uh, a very interesting talk on financial fair play. Uh, and we certainly look forward to um, uh, the updated data with uh, more recent observations. <laughs> but I will also try and uh, get you some comments myself uh, in, the, in the next week, Pedro. But thanks very much uh, once again. Thanks, everyone, for uh, your comments, too. We will return next week on December the 3rd, December already. Uh, and we've got Sarah Jewell uh, from the University of Reading, so a local presenter, uh, and she's presenting on cricket. Can awareness reduce or even reverse home bias evidence from international cricket? So do join us again next week. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.